King David wrote, I was glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Glad to be in his presence this morning. Uh, Church, let's stand together and pray. Lord, we love you. We ask that the meditation of our hearts, the songs on our lips, be pleasing in your sight, O God. We love you. It's in your name we pray. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown. from the fall Hail him who saves you by his grace and crown him Lord of all Hail him who saves you by his grace and crown him Lord of all and crown time and crown him Lord and crown him Lord of all. And open the eyes of my heart Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see of my heart, Lord, open the eyes of my heart, I want to see you, and I want to see you, to see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory, pour out your power and love as we sing holy. fall down 
the feet of Jesus, the greatness of mercy and love at the feet of Jesus. We cry, holy, 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 we cry. God said, take just a second, cross the aisle, figuratively and literally, shake somebody's hand, hug a neck, tell somebody good morning that you haven't had a chance to say hi to yet. In his hand, I just wanted to highlight a few things going on in the life of the church, uh, starting of a new year. Got a lot of things happening. Next week, January 8th, James is having a meeting. Those of those involved in planning the spring, uh, spring outreach event. Uh, that's going to be next Sunday after the service in the conference room. Now, if he's asked you to participate, if he's three minutes late, give him a little slack. He's working with your kids, okay? So meet in the conference room after church next week. If he's a couple minutes late, give him, give him some grace. He will be here to meet with you all to plan that. Last chance today to grab your Christmas cards. So please sing by the table and uh, make sure you've got your Christmas cards. Also, January 22nd is going to be our business meeting right after church. We're also, spoiler alert, we're also going to do a fire drill. This ought to be fun. Anybody know what a Chinese fire drill is? You ever been on a youth event where everybody gets out of the car, runs around the car, and gets back again? We're going to try to make it a little more organized than that. But January uh, and the security team has been working hard to lock down our securities ministry uh, to make that happen. Also, uh, payments for NYC youth group. Uh, the of you going to take the NYC payments are coming up soon. I just wanted to make you aware of that. Also, if you're on the praise team, the new, the new schedule's been out. I uh, handed out some paper copies. I also emailed out some digital copies. Uh, so just make sure all of your uh, planning center stuff is, uh, is up, up and ready to roll. Uh, with that being said, Dwayne, you got your team together. Let's take up the offering. This when, you, uh, when you give, it's not just to keep the lights on. You are giving to see um, outreach to the community. You're giving to stock the food pantry you're giving to see you're going to hear a lot more about come january 22nd um so that being said there's several ways to give by the way there's a qr code up there you can give online you can give in the plates if you're an introvert there's uh, boxes in the back that you can drop your tithe in on the way out let's pray father you're awesome thank you for the way that you have provided for us. Bless this offering. Further it for your kingdom. We love you, Lord. Amen. We can give our tithes and offerings and sing at the same time. Amen. We can multitask. Light of the world, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see Beauty that made this heart adore you Hope of a life spent with you So here I am to worship Here I am to bow down Yeah. 
As we continue service together, I invite you to take a posture of prayer. If that's seated in your pew, that's fine. If it's kneeling at the altar, the altars are open today for you. But I invite you now to, to ready your heart to start speaking to God. Dear Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for a day when we can celebrate the closing of one year and the the hope of another. Lord, move. In this place, Lord, we say, um, change our hearts today. Let the first Sunday of 2023 be one where we come ready to truly worship, to bow down before you, to be in awe of you, to be transformed. Lord, as we come, there are so many prayer requests and things in our community, so many things in the lives of the people of this church, from busted pipes and flooded houses to things that no one knows about that we keep to ourselves. Lord, I pray that in all these things that your presence is here with us, that you make yourself known. You create peace where there is none. Family, the Hermitage Church of the Nazarene, as they've lost a a sophomore, I believe, in high school this this last week and a half. Um, This time is a time of of joy and and grace and love, also a time when many have experienced and hurt. God, that is all of it. to carry each other along the road, but Lord, most of all, help us to rely on you. We love you. We love you. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, congratulations. You did it. 
You made it to 2023. Happy New Year. <laughs> Ooh, that's a dud. true of living years of life. Uh, I find that every year brings its own unique stages and challenges that um, when I think I've got a grasp on things, I quickly find I do not. And sometimes I find that my body doesn't do quite what I meant or it used to do. All right? I know none of you have experienced that, right? Sometimes the year after year, it doesn't get easier. Uh, some of us have picked up scars. We've picked up wounds. Some of them um, external, some of them internal, and this is, this is what we call life, and we celebrate another year of it today because though there's struggle, we believe ultimately life is a gift. The years we have together are a gift. This is a time when we uh, contemplate what was, what is, what will be. We think about what has been, and some of you, again, in the weeks, even the weeks and days leading up to this, there's, there's things that have happened, pipes that have burst, Surprises when you got home from church. But there's also been great times and triumphs, joys and, and grace that we've experienced this year. Today we come together with all this, the, the bad, the good, and the ugly, with the, the celebration of Christmas really. But as we, as we move into a new year, could you do something for me? I just want everybody just take a deep breath in. Breathe it out. Sometimes you need that steadying breath to get ready for the next thing. I don't know about you, but Christmas has been a little bit hectic. The New Year's has been a little, a something else to do, and, and Walmart already has out the next display for the next event we're supposed to be, be ready for, right? Sometimes we need that deep cleansing breath, that breath that breathes in and lets us know that God has saved us, to breathe out, to let us know that God has conquered death, that it's going to be okay. I, I often find myself breathing deeply. Um, I think Miss Yvonne in her years here can attest. I, I often sigh or breathe deeply, and she are you okay? I'm fine. I just, okay, I'm ready. I remember as a, a smaller, uh, younger, and slightly shorter, not much shorter, I'm pretty short still, uh, kid, I went to a, we were on a trip, and we went through, I believe it was to Texas, and we pulled into a rest stop, and, uh, well, in the long trips, you have to go. And I walked into the men's room, and I found all the stalls were, like, this level. Like, I was, you could see, like, if someone was sitting there, you could make eye contact. It's a weird feeling. In that moment, I had to take a deep breath. Not too deep. It's a bathroom, okay? But a deep breath and go, okay, right, and find a, a good open spot and, and do what you have to do. Sometimes you just need to take a deep breath to ready yourself for what's to come. I promise it's not going to be too much toilet humor today, okay? I just want to make sure you're still with me. Some of you look a little sleepy from the long night last night. That deep breath matters. And today, um, that breath, uh, where we find ourselves today is almost like in between. The celebrations are done, and tomorrow we return to work. This week we return to school. We're in a kind of in-between moment before the next thing happens, breathing and preparing ourselves. And it reminds me of a story that you'll find in the Bible in Matthew 4. And I invite you, if you have your Bible with you today, open it up to Matthew chapter 4. If you have the app, that's acceptable too. And if you don't have either, that's okay. John has you. I think it's behind me in here in a second. But I invite you to read this story, this story of a moment uh, in between almost, a story that we might not expect for a day like today, but the story that God's laid on my heart. If you would join me in reading Matthew chapter 4. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tested by the devil. He fasted 40 days. Him 
the holy city and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their, way, or on their hands they will bear you up, so you will not dash your foot against the stone. Jesus said to him, Again, it is written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory and said to him, All these I will give to you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And the devil left him, and suddenly angels came and waited upon him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. This might not be the story we think of. It has very little to do with Christmas, and we may not see much of what it has to do with New Year. But again, this is a story that takes You see right before this, if you turn your Bible back just a little bit, you'll see the baptism of Jesus. This moment when, I mean, look, our baptism services are great, right? But this one was a little extra special. Um, I don't know many that we've had here that have had the, like, Spirit of God descend as a dove and a light upon the person. The voice that spoke from above, the heavens opened up and said, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. It was a big day. It was setting things off and saying, it is started. And then uh, from there, if you turn to the verse after we stopped reading, the, I think the heading is that Jesus begins his ministry. Jesus begins his ministry in Galilee. I mean, he's starting his public ministry. This is like it's starting. It's happening. And in between, like a 40-day break in the wilderness. It's kind of weird. Really quickly, a quick aside. If you uh, are a young person today struggling with what you're going to do, just know that Jesus started his ministry when he was 30. So if you're 18 and you're like, I don't know what I'm going to do with my life, don't worry. You've got 12 years to be Christ-like and figure it out, okay? Take your time. I'm just kidding. We have, uh, you know, to be remade always. The story is, is this moment almost stuck in between. It's so much so that in the Gospel of Mark, it doesn't even fill out this whole story that the story read. It literally says Jesus was baptized, and he went out into the wilderness to be tested, and then it goes right on to the next thing. That's the story. I'd have been more like me. He was right. Let's get to it, right? If I was writing the story, I would... <laughs> If I was God and I was, I was orchestrating the story, I would have probably left this one out. Like, like, hey, let's get to the good stuff. Preparation is not my favorite. Is anybody, anybody else here? Wrapping presents, cleaning up for guests, not my favorite. Off, honestly, on youth trips, half the time, I'm just excited to go on the trip because I'm so sick so, of the preparation part. Like, I don't care. Let's just go, right? Preparation is not my favorite. It's not a new thing. Uh, I remember in Uh, religion majors in class and the professor, I feel like, okay, this may shock you, but we thought we knew more than we did. I know. I know. I I know. And yet, we were just excited to get out there and do something, and the professor kept saying, hey, 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 you know, Jesus took 30 years and only ministered for three, right? So, cool your jets. Preparation matters, but sometimes it's not the easiest thing to do. Because we get stuck in this mindset of, oh, if, just, if this would just happen, if I could just accomplish this, if I could just gain this or, or um, get here. And yet the way we prepare ourselves matters deeply, and that's what part of this story is about. Today we take advantage of, of the moment, the present that we are given. To say, God, come and prepare your way and your will inside of us. But again, preparation is not always easy, is it? Just to make you feel how pre- preparation matters, I'm going to give you a pop quiz today, right? You're like, man, I miss those. Every student loves pop quizzes, right? All right, so don't be afraid to shout out the answer if you know it. Keep track of how you do on this, all right? There's five questions. Yeah, I'm a youth pastor. That's what's going to happen. Are you ready? One of you's ready. This is great. All right. In CPR, there are the ABCs of CPR. What does the C stand for? There's airway. Breathing and what was that? Compressions. Gold star. Did you know that one? All right, keep track. All right, maybe, maybe medical stuff is not your thing. All right, maybe you're a sports guy. So I have a sports question for you. Uh, NBA legend Bill Russell won a lot of championships. Do you know how many championships he won? 11. You guys, it's pretty good. Sound booth is doing really good right now, guys. Lucky this is not a trivia game because they would be winning. All right, maybe sports isn't your thing. Maybe medicine, that's not your thing. What about history, okay? 
How many people signed the Declaration of Independence? Ooh. If it makes you feel better, I had to Google this one. So. <laughs> 56. 56 is the number. All right. Maybe history is not yours. Go a different route. Maybe you're someone that likes food and you like travel, okay? Um, if someone from England was at a restaurant and they ordered bangers and mash, what would they expect to show up at the table in front of them? Absolutely. Now, bangers and mash sounds way cooler, right? I'm, all right, how about this one? This one, we're in church. We should ask a, we should ask a church question, right? How many books are there in the Protestant Bible? A lot, hey, a lot of very It's like you're afraid to get it wrong. There's no penalty. It's okay. Yeah, 66, 72 in the Catholic Bible if you ever wanted to know. You didn't know you were taking a pop quiz today, did you? How'd you do? Did you, did you pass? Yeah, most likely most of us did because we weren't prepared for this. It's hard to know what to prepare for, especially when your you know, youth pastor gets up there and does a bunch of dumb questions, right? But preparation matters. This time when Christ is stepping away into the wilderness for 40 days to fast, to be tested, preparation matters. I mean, the honest truth is, some of us knew these facts because it's just part of our daily life. I love sports, so I knew this answer. Or I bought a medical show, or I did a training with the youth group, and so I knew the CPR. Whatever that is, sometimes we live life in a way that we soak up things. What are you living to prepare yourself for right now? What are the things that you, on a daily basis, preparing you for? I find, if I'm honest, honest, some of the things I do on a daily basis prepare me to do not much. What are we being prepared to do? And I think sometimes, like this pop quiz, you don't know what to expect. We don't know what the future holds. We don't know how to prepare. And so maybe we can learn the most from how Jesus, what this verse says here. Jesus was led by the Spirit. You see, the Spirit of God does not mislead. Amen? The Spirit of God does not mislead, but are we prepared to hear and follow? Because I'll be honest, if this was me and I'd have, if it was high on the, the experience of awesome baptism, I may have missed the voice, the, the pulling of the Spirit to pull lead me out into the wilderness. I could have been so focused on what I was thinking or what I was doing that I would have missed the leading. So how are we preparing our hearts today to hear, to follow, to respond? And that takes us to verse 1. Congratulations, we did it. Only 10 more to go. No. It's, it's kind of crazy to think, uh, you know, this whole chapter is about temptation, so I guess we'll talk about those two. Or this whole, I'm sorry, section is about it. But it's crazy to think, again, this, this amazing moment of baptism, followed up by this excruciating private temptation in the wilderness alone. It's weird to put these two things together side by side. As I, uh, one of the theologians or one of the, the commentaries I read said this, that great blessings are often followed by great temptations. And as I thought about this, this idea, there's something to that. I started to think about times in my life with good times and then, and again, temptations that followed, or used to things that could happen. That I thought, I thought, uh, have you ever come into a sum of money? I, I haven't, but I hope some of you have, right? But if we, if we get a, a bonus, we get all this, you know, whatever's happening, and it, the, the temptation might be for us. Security in our lives. Good thing, blessing, temptation. What about having a new baby? Nothing's wrong with having a new baby, right? Except for all the many diapers. Um, no, think about it. If you have a new baby, it's a blessing. It's amazing. And yet, if we're not careful, we can be really quickly be uh, tempted to be all of our existence. Uh, everybody else in the world, who cares about them? This is the only thing that matters. And while our kids matter, and they should matter highly, they should never take the, the ultimate role of God in our lives. Think about, and even in the church, pastors in the last five to ten years we've seen, they do this great work. They read a great book. They help people. And the praise comes in. 
And all of a sudden, the praise starts to get into their head, and we see uh, people that make decisions that ruin families and ministries. Good thing, temptation. It's, it seems like it happens more than we'd like it to be, that, that maybe temptation and the good times aren't as far apart as part of it could be. So it is that Jesus is led out to the wilderness really quickly, it seems like. And maybe that shouldn't be as surprising as it was to them. So if, if, if temptation is going to happen, if we're going to have it in our lives, I guess the question is not how do we avoid it, but how do we deal with it when it comes? I mean, let's be honest, temptation's hard. Uh, I've seen some of you when you're hangry, all right? Hungry, hungry. Oscar Wilde in his book, The Picture of Dorian Gray, said, the only way to rid yourself of temptation is to yield to it. But this story we just read, this, this story lived out by Christ, tells us a very different story, a very different truth about temptation. That temptation is not something that we are doomed to lose against. It's not a looming battle that we just might as well quit now. No, there's victory to be found. Let's dig into this together a little bit. So, just before we dig into the specific temptations and how they might apply to us, because they apply to us, let's look at real quick general temptation stuff that I needed to be reminded of maybe, maybe do as well. The first one is this. You know temptation, to be tempted is not to sin. I think we know that sometimes, but we forget it. Sometimes we feel guilt because of the temptations that come into our lives. And we forget that if we never have a chance to disobey, we never have a chance to choose obedience. So if you are tempted, it's not because you're weak, it's not because you're less than, it's not because you're broken, it's not because something is wrong with you. God, uh, who came as flesh, Jesus, who was 100% God but also 100% man, experienced temptation. It's okay. The thing is, temptations happen to all of us, but how we receive them and what we do with them matters much more than the fact that we're being tempted. You see, the story that we just read together, in the temptations, Jesus revealed who he was going to be as a Messiah. He revealed the character that he had. The same is true of us. When temptations come, how we react, how we respond, reveals what's going on inside of us. And sometimes it reveals that God has already been at work, and sometimes it reveals that God needs to work. But either of those, we just need God, and that's okay. The temptations, the last thing I want to kind of point out before we dig into the specific ones is sometimes it's easy to think about, well, he's Jesus. No wonder he was good at, you know, avoiding temptation, right? And yet, these temptations he faced were real. I mean, like, again, it's that the Sunday school went, well, he, Jesus, he's good. He's so great. But Jesus was tempted. Not Jesus had temptation that lesser people would fall. No, Jesus was tempted he came to be with us, to live as we live, to be a baby that needed someone to feed him and care for him, to love him. He went through real temptations that really affected him, things that really hurt the good news with this is, is when we go, oh, but God, you don't know what I'm going through, he does. Your God knows your struggle. And the truth is, sometimes we don't feel very known. To be known is a great gift, and your God, Jesus, who came, who we celebrated a week ago, his coming, knows you, and he knows what you go through. Your struggles are not foreign they are intimately known. That is the good news of, of temptation today. We're going to jump into the specific ones. Um, so buckle up. Are you guys ready? Do I need to noise? Everybody awake? No? Okay. So the first temptation, Jesus is alone. He's been out there for 40 days and 40 nights fasting and, and hearing from God, and Satan comes in this time. And the temptation is to make bread in this time. Now, my wife turns on Food Network a lot of nights right before she falls asleep. And she turns it on and then leaves it on. And she goes to sleep, and I sit and watch it for an hour, like, right? It's not good. 
But what I've learned is that what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to really transform the elements you get. That's how you get good scores on Food Network, right? So if Jesus had done this, had done this stone, or stone to bread, rather, he'd have been a Food Network star. star. All right. All right. But Satan comes and he attacks this physical need that he feels, this deep, this deep hunger in his And honestly, sometimes I'm tempted to eat even after I just ate. Okay? Anybody else? Just me. That's okay. I'm feeling the judgment here. The thing is, this hunger he felt wasn't wrong. And so it would, it, would, yeah, it might make sense. Yeah, Satan comes and says, hey, just, just make some bread. It's fine. Uh, to, to meet that hunger in the way that Satan was requiring would have stolen away the purpose that God had for him in that place. You see, God had led him out into the wilderness to fast, to prepare himself. It makes me wonder, what are the, maybe the good things in our lives that we're participating in and taking in? They're good, they're fine, but they might be stealing away from us the purpose that God has for us. What are the things that, while good on their own, are stealing us away from the better that God has? God has. It, maybe this was just for me, but I, I was challenged reading this story. Are even my needs and wants consecrated to God? He knows us deeply. So he knows the needs we have. He knows how the oxygen enters my mouth, goes in my lungs, and circulates through my blood. I don't get it. There's people that are smart and they can understand that. But God knows. He designed it. He knows our needs. Together in mother's womb. He's seen every step of our life from then on. He knows what he wants. But he says, I am still God. And Jesus in this place, re- re- I'm going to put my needs and my wants as the yourself. It's going to be okay. This isn't a big deal. You've got to take care of number one so you can take care of everybody else. And Jesus says, no, no, no. I rest fully in the purposes that God has for me. What a beautiful, beautiful, crazy story. The, story, the challenge is, is, Jesus, just use your power to do this one thing. And Jesus says, no, no, no. If I use my power like that, in a way that none of us could, am I really being among my people? If, he, if I used his power turned towards self, it would change the kind of Messiah he was. It denies the very incarnation of him coming to be. Instead, he says, no, I will meet this temptation with the power that we all share the word of God, the history of God's movement and the people. I love how he says, he says, it is written. In the Greek, the perfect tense, it means it's done and it continues to be done. When he says, it is written, uh, man does not live on bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of God. This is, it's set and it will forever be. It does not change. Steady in the word. Steady in what God has done and will do. This is a challenge for us because, again, sometimes we also have power that none other, others don't have. And we're tempted to use it in ways that serve us. Power we possess, the things we can do, the things we have, cannot be used for us. Instead, they're saying these are laid at God's feet and he can use them as he wants. This is just the first temptation, and I'm already challenged. The third thing I want to point out from this first one, don't you love how Satan comes in? He comes in, well, if you're really the son of God. Have any of you ever felt some self-doubt in your life? Sure, not you, right? Uh, One of the commentaries was saying that doubt is a favorite weapon of the evil one. It's this thing that we all struggle with, we all feel. And here Christ is being met with doubt. Satan very quickly says, you know that awesome baptism thing you just experienced? I mean, if you're really a son of God like he said, right? Well, prove it. If you're really that, if God really loves you that much, if, if you really believe what you believe, this doubt that Satan attacks with this passage, I think is something we can relate to. 
If you're afflicted with the voice of doubt in your life, the doubt that makes you wonder um, what God has called you to be, how much he loves you, or anything else, know that you're not alone. You walk in good company because Jesus also heard those words. Jesus walked the path ahead of us so that we can walk our way through it. This first temptation asks us the question, am I, am I after the purpose of God? Am I using the power I have for God? I'm struggling with doubt. It's everything I have consecrated. I won't lie. That's a lot of temptation for one quick sentence from Satan, isn't it? The second one has a lot as well. Uh, so Jesus very quickly you know, shuts it down with the word of God. And see, Satan comes and says, well, let me show you something else. It's like that pesky salesman that won't just like leave you alone, right? No, I don't want this. He comes with that next thing. He shows him, um, or he stands up there and stuff like that. You can throw yourself off your you can trust you have in God. I think this, uh, this temptation was, was an interesting one. First of all, I don't like heights, so I'd have been like, <laughs> duh, no, right? And yet, um, I think the temptation here really had nothing to do with, with this. It was about, well, if you believe in God, prove it. Make a big show, make a big spectacle, show us what you really believe. Sensationalism versus humble obedience. Which do you think the world has more of right now? When I turn on the news, I don't see humble obedience and service. I see sensationalism. And unfortunately, we as the people of God participate in this cycle of sensationalism, of, of the big show. And here Jesus rejects this and says, no, God is not my vending machine to take from what I want when I want it. He is not to be tested. He is God. So too, we must say to the sensationalism that surrounds us, this show is not what I follow. God is what I'm about. And isn't it interesting that Satan quotes, quote, I know uh, you've heard other pastors preach about it. I'm not selling you anything new, but isn't it interesting he says scripture? Now, he misuses it. Not that that happens today, right? People misusing scripture. That's crazy. Just because just someone throws a Bible verse on it does not mean they know the will of God or even care about the will of God. It's like believing everything you uh, see on the internet. It's not a good idea. But the thing is, you know, not be a people who use the word of God to accomplish our ends and means. Pull out our favorite verses, verse convenient and comfortable. Uh, say this verse, you know, oh, I love this one, this one, and uh, ignore the ones that are inconvenient for my truth. We are people called not to be justified by the word, but to be informed by the word. In their arena, use the word of God to make their own agendas come true. And here we are humbly no, no, no. Lord, search me and change me. This, this belief in part, this half belief, this um, casual belief that some of us struggle with is not going to against the freedom that God has for us. When we have a, a casual belief or a, a, a shallow belief, when Satan comes and he gives us a little bit of justification, we go, oh yeah, that sounds good. Right? And yet because Jesus was hold, held fast, he was deep, he was committed, consecrated and prepared, he's able to say that's not the whole story. You see, yeah, while it is written that, that it also has said do not put the Lord your God to the test. This challenges me and maybe challenges some of you today. Are we, are we all in? Are we transformed by the words which we come to hear, which we hold in our hands and on our phones? Third temptation. Satan comes back one more time. He takes him up on the high mountain and he shows him everything and he shows him all the kings of the world and he said, this all could be yours for the low, low price 
right? All you have to do is worship me. One of the things I say, hey, I could be above all. I could be, I could be the guy. That one didn't hit home with me as much. I think what I saw was this temptation. You could do the victory that people really want. You could do what all the people really want you to do anyway. You know, they don't want a savior. They want a military leader. They want Israel to be saved. Just do what the people want. There's a lot less pain this way. If you just go with the flow, if you just let me kind of take the lead, there's no cross in this way. I mean, if you win, does it really matter how you do it? Barrett said, the old but ever new temptation is to do evil so that good may come, to justify the illegitimacy of the means through the greatness of the ends. You see, for Jesus to obtain the kingdoms of the world in this way was to say yes, to say yes to loving power, to say yes to political oppression, to say yes to military conquest. This was the path that Satan was displaying before him, that I'll give them through these things. And it may seem justified. Yes, if Jesus is over the whole world, that's pretty good, right? We like that. And yet Jesus says, get away from me. That's not who I am and not what I'm about. And in this moment, it's revealed he is not a person that's just trying to hold on to power, trying to hold on to political sway. Instead, he says, I work through self-sacrifice and service and love. It is a drastically different path which we are called to take. The world around us says, no, if you don't have the political capital, you, you can't get things done. The world around us says, if you don't have the power, how are you going to protect yourself or, you, or those around you that you care about? And yet Jesus here says, those things are not the core of who I am what I'm, what I'm about. I operate from love and self-sacrifice and service. The question for us today, which are we holding on to? The temptation of power giving uh, the sacrament. There are two paths before us and Jesus is leading only in one of them. In all these things, Jesus was tempted when he was weak, when he was struggling, when he was down. He was tempted to use his strength. He was tempted when he was tired, hungry, and alone. But in all of these temptations, there was victory. And that is the good news for us today because the same temptations that we face and that we deal with, Christ said, I have made a way, I have shown the path. And there is victory here. Temptation is not instant defeat as Oscar Wilde might have assumed. Temptation is a chance for God's glory to be shown. You see, at the end of this story is not, and then Jesus finally gave up and gave in. No, he sent Satan away with great authority and the devil left, and the angels came, and they waited upon him. I, you know, I think about, they, maybe they brought food, maybe they did that, but I bet they also had a, quite a, a big party, don't you? Jesus had shown who he was going to be. He'd shown the Messiah he was going to be, and it was a celebratory moment if there ever was one. What has been and what will be. In this moment, Jesus said, it is good. And I made it so When you compare this to Adam and Eve, they had paradise and Jesus had the wilderness. They had bounty and Jesus was hungry. They had a companion with him and Jesus was alone, and yet they felt temptation because they were trying to take the will of God and make it. Make Consecrated these years of my life to what God might want from them. Have we consecrated 2023 to God? Are we joining in the angel celebration, rejoicing because God has reigned victoriously above sin, and that's going to be the story of our lives this year? Because the year ahead is one of hope. It is one where we can rest in the power of Jesus, not in the power which we might take for ourselves, but the power he gives in grace, love, and self-sacrifice. What is your prayer for 2023? And how are we going to face it? 
I invite you to think. We, in our family, we make a, a list of our goals for the year. Jonah was going to read five books, I think. Did you do it? Good job. I was not very confident. Right? We have this list of goals on our wall, and at the end of the year, it's really just for us to go, ooh, I didn't ever do that 5K I was supposed to do. Right? What are we doing with the year? What are we preparing it to be? What are we consecrating it to be? Are we giving it to God and saying, God, do something special? Because the truth is, 2023 is not a blank canvas waiting for our great artwork. It is a blank canvas. Our lives are a blank canvas waiting for us to hand a, a psalm, a prayer that I'd like you to watch, us to watch together. Is our prayer, isn't it? As I looked up New Year's verses, I saw many that were things like, Lord, bless and keep our plans. But the true, true prayer for me this year for our church is, Lord, create in us a clean heart. Restore the joy of our salvation and do something amazingly here. As Jesus went through this moment, this breath of a time that prepared him to go forward, I pray that this time where we come together, it prepares us to go out because just like Jesus, there's public ministry to go get to doing. Your lives are to go and live the grace, love, and peace of Jesus Christ.